that today you're going to give us the plan and the strategies of how to apply it and that your presence was going to be very strong here and that's exactly what's going on and we thank you God said it's one of those watershed moments folks watershed means that it's going to course but he's going to he's going to take it another course so we're going with him we're pushing into his presence into his spirit but father i thank you that you are giving out new mantles this morning father we've we've all learned some things and experienced some things and even this morning we're experiencing and learning but now god you're going to give us the new mantles to walk into this to absolutely walk into it to push into it and the beauty of it is we don't have to push by ourselves you're there with us to push us in there you're alongside of us you're our rear guard so father i thank you for the new mantles that you're giving out right now in the name of jesus and i'll be very honest with you what i'm hearing is that there's somebody here that's getting a new you're going to feel something around your head and God says, I'm changing the way you think. Yeah, I'm changing the way you're thinking. He said, I'm giving you a new, a, my, what I'm telling you how to think about things. The things that you've seen in the past were, they were, they were perverted. And when I say perverted, I'm not saying perverted things, but they were perverted to the word of God. And so God says, I'm giving you a new way of thinking this morning. And he said, be happy. We thank you, Lord, for the new mantles. Now, God, we're going to get rid of all the old ones that don't work for us anymore. We're not going to hold on to those stuff. Don't take them to goodwill either, because they can't use them. You get rid of them. Burn them up. Thank you, Father. You may feel your hands tingle. You may feel it in your arms. You may feel it on your shoulders, your head. It's custom for you. God is so loving that he's customizing this to you personally. Now then, we thank you for the winds of change that are blowing. We experienced those winds yesterday. Some of them were very cool winds that kept us from getting very hot in that weather. But we absolutely felt the winds of change blowing yesterday. We called in the four winds. That was the opening prayer, was we called in the winds of change and then the four winds of God to come in from the north, south, east, and the west and to blow. And so, Father, we want it again today. We're asking for your wind to blow on us and blow into us, blow life into us like you blew into Adam. Some of us are very tired. We've, we've spent a lot of our energies, and now we need to be re-energized if you will so blow your strength into us and your life into us then blow all the junk off of us some of you have had some words spoken over you this weekend that weren't very that just weren't the best for you to hear and the Lord said let me blow them off of you don't be offended let him blow them off forgive and release them and let them blow off thank you father you may hear the wind, feel the wind, or see the wind. Now, Father, I thank you that you say, that your word says you'll shake everything that can be shaken. And so, Father, you've been shaking me really good, and I need to be shook. Father, I welcome the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord oftentimes manifests as shaking and tremors. And so, Father, we release our restraints to you to visit us with the fear of the Lord and let us feel your shaking and your tremors. Last night when I went to bed, I, I shook like a rag. I could feel it. It was just being in that presence of God. We welcome the fear of the Lord, and that's what I told him. I said, I welcome the fear of the Lord. Now, Father, shake off all that junk that needs to be shaken off of us you said it makes more room for more of you so fill us up now father the 
said you were going to give us oil. He loves this one. Fresh oil. He says it's golden and it's thick and it covers us from the head to our very feet, soles of our feet. Father, we don't want any little cracks in it that allows the enemy to come in and penetrate it. We want to be completely covered with your anointing oil. Cover us in Jesus' name. You may feel a warmth all over your body. You may even see it. Many people see it. I have not. Now, Lord, I thank you. This is the one that I like so well. Send down your fire, just like we we had on that worship. That was excellent, Rita. That was just excellent. Send down your fire. The first fire burns out all the junk in us. Revelations 1.14. His eyes were white. His hair was white like wool, and his eyes had fire. Those eyes of fire look down inside of us, folks. You've got to get a reality of this. This is a reality. His eyes of fire look deep down inside of us. It can see the pure from the unpure, righteous from unrighteous. If you think you've got something hid from him, well, guess again, he can see it. Father, we say, we surrender to you. Come down and burn out the unpure and the unrighteous in us. Burn out all the junk that we have been protecting all these years that we may be even enjoying, but we surrender it to you. Burn us up. And then we want what these folks just sang about. We want fresh fire. Send down your fresh fire on us. And again, burn us up with great zeal to want your presence, your love, to be your love, to read your word and understand your word, and to apply your word, to be obedient to your word. Not just read it, but to be obedient, to be transformed. You're preparing us for a reformation. Burn us up, Lord. Send us fresh fire. Thank you, Father. We're going to want to be more intimate with you. We're going to be willing to turn the television off. We're going to be willing to stop what we do on that phone just to spend precious time with you. Now, Holy Spirit, you said you want to move around the room and you want to heal. Signs, wonders, and miracles and healings. He's told me he's getting ready to come and do this, and I think, I think he's already here. A while ago, he says, I'm here, I'm here. Tell him what you need. If you got an emotional need, a spiritual need, or a physical need, tell him what you need. Holy Spirit, Spirit of might, I thank you for the Spirit of counsel that tells us what we need. And he may tell you about some stuff that you need you're not even aware of. That's that Spirit of counsel. We welcome you. And we welcome the Spirit of might. And that's the healing signs, wonders, and miracles. Come on us. We need it. Father, I can't see the ear, nose, and throat until October. I need this ear healed up. I don't need a tube in it. I need your touch to it. Thank you, Father. We surrender to you. Now, Father, we've got some beautiful keys here, very special keys. Every one of the keys here fits a certain door or a gate. Some of you may be gates. You open up wider. And so, Father, take us put us in the door lock that we fit into and turn us again in that turning it may be inconvenient it may be uncomfortable uh, it may cost you some relationships it's just because those people won't go where he's sending you but let him turn you you surrender to him so that he can turn you there's a turning he said about two or three weeks ago he said that you also lock doors and so, Father, there's some doors that everybody here needs to lock and that we don't open up anymore. 
show us, Father, those doors that we must lock and, and not ever open them again. We thank you, Lord. We will not look to the rear to see where we've been, to hear the voices calling us back where we can't go, should not go, nor to the sides of the enemy trying to tell us why we can't go or shouldn't go. We will move forward. And Father, we seal all this by the blood of Jesus. We seal it by the blood of the, G of the Lamb, Jesus. Thank you, Father. And Father, when the enemy tries to come in and steal it from you, folks, I want you to allow him to play this back to you. Remember what he has told you and hold on to it and move forward. That's what I do. Thank you, Father. In Jesus, Father, let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven in Jesus' name, amen. How many people experienced a manifestation, some kind of a manifestation? Okay. As, as soon as you started with, you know, talking about the cool breezes, you know, at, um, yeah, in Springfield, yeah, as soon as you, those words came out of your mouth, we felt the cool breeze coming through here, like a soft, cool breeze Praise just coming God. through here. And I looked at Rita and I, all of us right here, we were just, even this guy, I can't think of his name, Amy, but anyway, that cool breeze just coming up, Praise and God. it just, just, it's just very gentle, cool breeze, refreshing. Refreshing. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Wait a minute. Oh, good. Praise God. I'm not, when I say this, I'm not trying to take away from what you said because you don't have the AC time to what you're saying. Yeah. But the AC kicked off. And as soon as you started talking about breeze, the AC kicked off. But I think why that's important is, is not, it doesn't make it any less miraculous because we're praying for things and we're expecting things. Mm -hmm. And will we recognize when the manifestation of the spiritual reality that we are calling upon to manifest? when it does manifest in a mechanical form, when it does manifest in a governmental form, when it does manifest in an institutional way, will we recognize it and not be so... Right. That's what this is about. Yeah, but, but will we recognize when the Father manifests what yeah. we've been praying about Yeah. so that way we can give thanks properly and walk in Yeah, the that's right. Thank you. Thank you. Praise God. Thank you. Anybody else? Praise too, and earlier during praise and worship, I felt shaking. Did you? Yeah. Praise God. How, where did you shake? Good. That's good. That's important. Did you have something? Okay. Anybody else? Wait a minute, she's got something back here. One of these days he's going to get some. What'd you get? I just felt the anointing just go over my head. It just wow. saturated me. Praise God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Anybody else? All right, all minds free. Is there any prophetic words? Has anybody got anything, a prophetic word to share? All right, I'm gonna turn this over to Dan. We are thrilled to have Dan Blackshear with us to come up for our, 
our Springfield Median to be with us today. He gave up Father's Day to be here with us. So let's give him a hand. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do you want this or do you want this? This will be fine. Can be fine. I turn this around? To Absolutely. Set this on? We'll do anything you want us to do. All right. Thank you. Can you do a back handspring after that? Can I do what? The a back, back handspring. I'll try. Okay. You said anything <laughs> I want. How far out do you Okay, that, this will be good right here. Um, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for what you released yesterday. Yes. And Lord, we don't take it lightly that, Lord, the most valuable thing that we have is your presence. And Lord, we just honor you for the things that you are doing and the things that you have promised and the people that you're using and Lord, we today yield ourselves to what you're speaking in the moment so that, Lord, we can stay rightly connected to where you are and what you're saying in the middle of the shaking. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so um, this morning I want to share with you what, like, Verlinda's emphasizing knowledge. Why is it she's emphasizing knowledge? And I'm going to tell you why, and when Verlinda comes back in here, because she needs to hear this, I, you need to understand why God's emphasizing knowledge and not wisdom right now. And the reason is because the scripture says where there is no vision, that's prophetic revelation, the people perish. That word perish does not mean destroyed. It means that they cut off restraint. Okay, so what that means is you have to imagine it like a boat that's tied to a dock. The ropes that are tied to that dock are restraining that boat. When people don't have a prophetic revelation of either where they're going or what they're called to or purpose, then they begin to cast off restraint. It is a picture of a boat that is just taken to and fro whatever way the wind blows, whatever way the current's going. And so what ends up happening for those people that don't have a clear understanding of purpose and calling is they begin to do things that destroys their calling and purpose instead of empowering it. But now this is very interesting. It says in Hosea 4, 6, and we're going to talk about Hosea this morning to understand where our nation is and what God's doing. But in Hosea 4, 6, it says, my people are destroyed. That means to be cut off. For a lack of knowledge, because you have rejected knowledge, I reject you from being a priest to me. And since you have forgotten the law of God, I also will forget your children. See, this is part of the emphasis of the Nazarite vow. It's not that we're trying to earn God's love and favor by the rules it's that positionally, because of what Christ has accomplished, he sees us as holy. But he does say, be holy even as I am holy. In other words, we're walking out obedience to him to bring the earthly members of our body into subjection to the positional holiness that we already have. You see what I'm saying? And so because of that, when every obedience is the key to everything because obedience is a manifestation of holiness and so this morning understand that the best battle plans come from intelligence of what the enemy is doing or planning so when she's talking about knowledge she's not talking about book learning Jesus put it this way. He said to the Pharisees when they were praising him, he said, your words are for me, but your heart is far from me. In other words, they were flattering him with their lips, but their heart had destroying him in it. And so that's the thing that you need to understand. Whenever I go into any type of a meeting where I know it's going to be intense, I always pray the same thing. Lord, let me hear their heart, not their words. 
The reason is because if their words are harsh towards me and yet God reveals their heart is good towards me, I can receive the correction and it makes me better afterwards. If their heart is evil and their words are for me, then it's flattery to manipulate and control me. Or if their heart, words are harsh towards me, I already know their heart is bad and they roll off me like water off a duck's back. So knowing the intelligence of what is going on in the enemy is very important. I love the scene in the movie Patton. In the movie Patton, Chris is clapping for me. In the movie Patton, there's a scene where Patton's army is destroying Rom, Rommel's army. And he says this. It's George C. Scott, the actor, that says it. He says, Rommel, you SOB, I read your book. Yeah. He said, I read your book. In other words, he knew what the enemy was going to do, and so his whole battle plan was based off of what he already knew the enemy was going to do. That's the whole purpose of a word of knowledge. It's to reveal to you what's truly going on, so what you do next is based off of what needs to happen for the enemy to be defeated in that area. And so this morning, I just wanted to share with you something very important. God is not a narcissist. He doesn't need our worship. Do you understand that worship is not for him, it's for you? And at the beginning of the year, I knew things were going to be crazy in our nation. And the Lord said, whatever has your focus has your worship. And whatever you worship, you become. That's good. That's really good. And so when you look at the scripture, I want you to turn with me to Psalms 115. What I wanted to do this morning is I want us to give us knowledge on if there's any idolatry in our life because that's what God's dealing with but also it's to give us compassion for those who have given themselves over to idolatry to understand why they do the things that they do okay so in Psalms 115 verse 3 it says but our God is in heaven he does whatever he pleases their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk nor do they mutter through their throat. Look at that last line. Those who make them are like them, so is everyone who trusts in them. Jesus himself said to the Pharisees, you are the blind leading the blind. Why? Why? He said, your traditions have made the word of God of no effect. Their idol was their position and their traditions. Their idol, don't crucify me for this, was scripture. They were so convinced what Messiah would look like when he showed up, they were blind to Messiah when he was standing in front of them. It's a big deal what Chris said, because if we're not looking for where God is and what God is saying in the midst of the chaos, we won't recognize him when he's answering the very things we've been praying for, because it will come in a form that if we're not looking for him, we'll miss it. So what we're seeing today is we are seeing 
people that have given themselves over to idolatry. I'm not talking about Christian and non-Christian. I'm talking about the reason there's an Moses, a Moses and Elijah is because those that are, been, are captive to idolatry from the world and those that are captive to idolatry that's within the church. It's all idolatry. Like for me, um, when I was doing the podcast with Chris yesterday, basically what I was sharing with him was how God had to break me out and deliver me from, I was worshiping my past. And I was making my past more powerful than what God had done for me. So I had given myself over to idolatry to what I had done or what had happened in my past. And I was using that as the excuse for why my present wasn't changing. And once I allowed God to deal with every lie that I believed about myself, about him, and about what's possible, then all of a sudden my circumstances started to change. Why? Because whatever you worship, you will become. And if a person is worshiping their past, they're worshiping something that's been thrown into a sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered again. How many of you realize that worship of your past is nothing more than necromancing? Because the Bible says the old man is dead. And so the two greatest uh, cripplers, I said this yesterday, but I want to expound on it in the body of Christ, is the inability to deal with disappointment and then resentment or unforgiveness. Listen to what 2 Peter chapter 1 says. It says in 2 Peter chapter 1, it says, As his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. I'm just trying to share with you why is this Nazarite vow coming to the forefront? Because God is telling us that there is, we're coming to a place where the people that he used are not going to have compromise in their life. And the reason is not because he doesn't have grace and mercy for your compromise. He understands the weight of the promise fulfilled is the very thing that's going to test our character, not failure. Failure doesn't test a man. In Proverbs, it says silver and gold are tested by fire, but a man's character is tested by giving him a little bit of fame. So the greatest pressure we'll ever be under on our walk with God is when he fulfills what he's told us he would fulfill. Because when he does that, the opportunity to function in arrogance and pride and then become independent of him and go into idolatry takes effect. I heard a testimony from a man. He made $2 million in one day. In one day. He made one sale. His cut of that sale was $2 million after taxes. Today, he will tell you that's the worst thing that ever happened to in his life because it destroyed his family. Because he didn't have the character to develop, to handle the weight of that responsibility, he actually empowered every dysfunction in his kids, and they're all addicts today. And so understand that many times we look at delay as something that is We've done something wrong. God's mad at us. We've missed him. And the reality is many times delay is God's protection. Yesterday I got a prophetic word that was got my attention. <laughs> because the lady that was giving me the word started out by, I see you at Bucky's. You know Bucky's, the gas station? It's like unbelievable gas stations like the Disney world of gas stations I'm the type of person where when I stop to get gas it's like a NASCAR pit stop I'm fueling up I'm using a restroom getting something to drink if I need it and bang I'm back on the road well I'm walking around in Bucky's and this is what she said in the prophetic word you were sitting there and I've got it recorded 
She said, things sometimes have been dam damned up. She said, that's been for your protection. This is what, what's incredible is this. On Monday, I'm talking about last Monday, I was coming back from Arlington, Texas. I stopped at a Bucky's. I've gotten lots of prophetic words. They have never started out. I see you at Bucky's. <laughs> On Monday, I'm standing in Bucky's. I am mulling around, looking around, can't decide if I want coffee. I'm just like kind of walking around, taking my time, completely uncharacteristic. I go out to my car to get in to leave, and I decide, you know, I think I saw something in there I may want. And so I got back and wandered around Bucky's. I was probably in there for 30 minutes. I got in my car, got back on I-20. I wasn't even on the road for five minutes, and I got stopped. Both, uh, both lanes of traffic were stopped. It took me to go maybe 500 yards took 30 minutes to go 500 yards. When I got to the front of what was going on, there was two straight uh, state trooper cars with their lights on and they were parked. I looked out into a field and that field, there was an 18 wheeler. It had gone, it would be like an 18 wheeler from this building all the way across that whole lot over there out onto the other street. That's how far it went out into the middle of a field. And I looked over to my right, and there was a mangled pile of metal sitting there. And then when I drove by, you could see between the two state trooper cars, the medical team had not even shown up yet. And there was a stretcher laying there with a body covered, and blood was covering where the head was. And that person had died, and I began to intercede for their family. But understand that here I am, and I called my wife immediately, and I said, I think the Lord just protected my life. And I told her what happened, and she said, I agree. Two days later, I'm at home, and I'm at the gym, and somebody that I haven't seen in a while, but I recognize his voice, hadn't seen him in years. We decided to catch up, and I'm actually late for a phone call commitment that I had by 10 minutes. And when I leave the gym, I go to the same stoplight I have to go to every single time, and a car had hit another car, and went right through the lane where I would have been sitting and ran up into a building in the front of a... And so the point that I'm trying to make is sometimes delay, you think you've done something wrong, it's simply God's protection. And the wilderness is not punishment, it's a part of the path to get you to the promised land. And so it says here about his divine nature has given you all things you need for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance. To, oh boy, don't we all wish that wasn't in there. To perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness as has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. So even your, the time that you've been walking with the Lord can become idolatry. Because it, you can become unteachable. Yes. Is, this, is this making sense? I'm just trying to. And so we have to recognize that um, your history with God is really important. The Bible says we overcome the devil by the blood of the lamb the word of our testimony and not loving our lives unto death. And what I was talking about with Verlinda in the car on the way home is I have now, the years that I have under my belt make faith in a present crisis a responsibility, not an option. Yeah. 
Because when God comes through the first time, that's your testimony. When he comes through the second time in the same area, guess what? That's another testimony. But eventually it gets to be where you have a history of God's faithfulness and it demands that you look at the current crisis that he's already proven himself faithful in and you have a responsibility to look at it in faith. Many people, I've heard people teach that when they would carry their staff, they would carve the testimony of God's faithfulness in their life. When Moses was standing at the Red Sea, God said, you do something. You stick your staff in there. He wasn't saying that stick had power. He was saying, you stick your history that you have with me in the middle of that obstacle and it will part. So it doesn't matter what we're facing you stick your relationship in the middle of it, and it'll part. Okay, so what I wanted to share with you is this. Um, in Hosea chapter 2, let's look at Hosea chapter 2, because this is really where we are, I believe, as a nation. This is what's happening. This is what this whole Moses and... This is what the whole Moses and Elijah, what the Nazarite thing is all about. This is where we are as a nation. This is the shaking that we're experiencing as a nation. And so it says right here, Say to your, this is verse 1, say to your brethren, my people, and your sister, mercy is shown. I was in a meeting in Arizona several years ago, and a man had a dream. It was a huge meeting with people, and Dutch was there. And in the dream, this man said it was raining gold coins. And Dutch was in the dream. And he bent down and he picked up a gold coin. And when he looked at it, it had an eagle on one side. And when he flipped it over, I have one of those coins. It said mercy. And the Lord said mercy is the new currency for this season. And so here it says, this is what God used that coin vision when he took me here to say, that's confirming where we are as a nation. Mercy is shown. And now listen to this because he starts talking about their idolatry. Remember, the whole reason I'm sharing this is because understand, any time idolatry starts to creep in, whatever you worship, you become. Some people worship worship. How do I know that? Because some people come in, will come in here, Verlinda's told me, and they'll say, the worship is too loud, the worship is too long. It's not, they want it a certain way, not understanding that, they're, the worship is for them, it's not for God. God is not a narcissist. Giving is not for God, it's for us. There's a whole thing he implemented called seed time and harvest. And so if you refuse to sow, don't expect the harvest. In his mercy, he will help you, but you'll never come into the fullness of what he has for you because the Bible says, give and it shall be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together, overflowing without measure. Will I cause men to give into your bosom? So like, let me tell you how this works. We had a group in our church who they were going to rescue every orphan in Africa. Praise God. Thank you for that vision that God's given you. So I'm over the accounting of the church. And... They said, well, they got this big mission trip plan, and so we're going to set up a separate account. So people, guess what I knew? I knew in my spirit, I knew two things. Number one is this was only going to require work from me because I was going to have to set up this special account. And number two is then I was going to have to go through all the effort to return everybody's money to them when they didn't go. And <laughs> so I told the leader of our church, I said, I'll do this, I said, but just understand they're not going. Well, you know, everybody wants to say, well, you're being awfully judgmental. How do you know they're not going? I said, the word says that he who is faithful in a little will be made ruler over much. I said, this is probably 
10, 15 people that are going on. I said, there's not a single person in there that has served one day in our children's ministry. Why would God send them to Africa when they haven't shown themselves faithful here? So the people that gave were their friends and family. Well, for 10 or 15 people, that can be quite a few people. They were short thousands of dollars, so the trip got canceled. And guess what? I got to cut checks in all those people's names and return them the money. Because in a church situation, when money is designated for something, you can't just use it for anything. So you, I had to communicate with all these people, do you want your money back or, or do you want just the church to use it whatever way it seems fit? And so understand that, that there's a lot of people that have a lot of, of, quote, words from God that will never be fulfilled because they've never served anyone else's word. And so sometimes the prophetic word itself can become an idol. And then what happens? The enemy tries to convince the person they've done something wrong. It really wasn't God. It was No, it's probably because of the fact that you're not doing anything to help anyone else's word get fulfilled. It's seed. You're giving, you're sowing, seed time and harvest. Like the church that I'm a part of, I don't lead, I'm there to serve. I'm sowing. I'm here because God said to sow into what God's doing in Illinois. I'm in Indiana because I'm sowing into what God's doing in Indiana. And I'll come to Missouri. It's not that I'm needing a circuit to teach on. I don't need that. I'm, I'm trying, I want to see God's will done in the earth, but what my gifting and calling is, is to come alongside others to help, like as a co-pilot, them navigate to the fulfillment of their word, which is supposed to be what the apostolic is. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. And so what we've done is we've taken the church and we've put apostles or pastors up here at the point and everybody comes to that building to serve the vision of the pastor or the apostle and now we've taken the very thing that God said I will build and we've turned it into the idol and when you let me just share this when when that happens I'm I'm going to share anyway but I, I just wanted to say when that happens What happens is this, is that the Bible says there's two types of wisdom. There's wisdom that comes from heaven, and there's earthly wisdom. And when earthly wisdom is what's functioning, the scripture tells us one of the manifestations, or a couple of the manifestations, are envy and control. It says they are sensual and they are demonic. A lot of times when these big leaders are so talented that what they're putting out there is sensual and people follow them and they're actually worshiping a man, they're not worshiping the Lord. And so then when they fall, everybody's faith becomes shipwrecked. (laughs) right Chris is about to start shouting amen (laughs) so I'm trying to help us understand that what God is doing right now is he's dealing with all the idolatry in the church and outside of the church because whatever you worship you become and if you're in an environment where a spirit of control is leading it will manifest itself in confusion. And that's the way that it controls. I've, I've shared this with other people in here personally, but understand a spirit of control always has to have a foundation of confusion to stay in control. 
Have you ever noticed sacrifices made to idols are never because the idol has told them to. It's always to keep something from happening bad in the future. <laughs> because they don't talk. You're basically having a barbecue while you're being superstitious. They can't see. They can't smell. We just read that. They, they can't talk. And so when there's a spirit of control present in a relationship or in the leadership of anything, doesn't matter if it's a civil government or a church government, it will always manifest itself in three main weapons. So number one, it has to have a foundation of confusion to stay in power. This is all part of idolatry. That's why I'm sharing it. So when you hold someone accountable for something they said or did, they will always come back with, you misunderstood what I'm saying. Or they'll even say, I didn't say that. It doesn't matter if you play it right back to them. I've watched people confront politicians and said, you said this, and they say, no, I didn't. And they have a video of them saying it. And then when they're confronted with the video, well, that's not what I meant. That's all a manifestation of a spirit of control. And so the three main weapons of a spirit of control, this is all part of idolatry, is it will be accusation, intimidation, and pity. Accusation, intimidation, and pity. So the spirit of control will accuse you of the very thing it's doing. And if that doesn't work to get you to cower to it, it will now in, try to intimidate you through threatening you. But it's, the end goal is to get you to do what it wants you to do. Yeah. And if that doesn't work, it'll try to use pity. Yeah. And it'll claim victimhood. That's why we had you know, that whole summer where we were having all these riots and the people that were rioting are screaming, we're the victims and they're the ones burning down the poor innocent victims building. Right. And so it says here in verse 2, oh, and let me just tell you, there's only one way to, to deal with a spirit of control. You have to starve it out. A spirit of control knows that it's in control if it can get an emotional reaction from you. So like when I'm walking people through abusive relationships, I tell them to pray. Lord, no matter what comes out of their mouth, I will not be offended. Because if you become offended, your emotions will get out of control and you'll react to what they're doing or saying instead of responding out of your identity that will shut it down. You have to starve it out. So like everything becomes a business deal. An unemotional business deal. You don't give them any emotions, no matter what they do. Because that spirit will know it's still in control if you react emotionally. It'll know it's losing control if you respond out of your identity. When they demanded Jesus to tell them who they were, he kept silent and they manifested what was really in them. Does that make sense? So I've walked a lot of people out of relationships and institutions that were driven by a spirit of control. Verse 2 says, bring charges against your mother, bring charges, for she is not my wife, nor am I her husband. Isn't that interesting? There's a whole group of people that are claiming God is father that he doesn't even know. There's whole denominations claiming God is father that he doesn't even know. How do I know? Because when you work your way over into idolatry, then you change God into your own image instead of worshiping who he truly is. They have literally built a God with their own hands who is okay with sin. They have built a God with their own hands that doesn't demand change. They've built a God with their own hands where compromise is celebrated. He says, let her put away her harlotries from her sight and her adulteries 
from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked and expose her as in the day she was born, and make her like a wilderness and set her like a dry land. That word wilderness there means desert. So what God says is, if people are in idolatry or harlotries, it may go on for a while, but there's going to come a point where he says, I'm going to expose everything. I'm amazed by some of the leaders that have fallen and how they had to have had... Like, I have a fear of the Lord. I know the word. I know that if I begin to allow sin and compromise into my life, it may go on for a little while, but guess what? He says whatever's done in secret is going to be revealed openly, and what you do in private is going to be shouted from the mountaintop. And says this, I will not have mercy on her children, for they are the children of harlotry. For their mother has played the harlot. She who conceived them has behaved shamefully. For she has said, I will go after my lovers who give me bread and my water, my wool and my linen, my oil and my drink. Now this is what's getting exposed right now in this nation. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up your way with thorns and wall her in so that she cannot find her paths. She will chase her lovers but not overtake them. Yes, she will seek them, but she will not find them. Then she will say, I will go and return to my first husband, for there it was better for me than now. How many of you know what happened in Cape Henry, Virginia, April 29th, 1609. I mean, 1607. That was when the, the first group came on shore with John Smith's expedition. They planted a cross in the ground and entered covenant with God on behalf of this nation. I believe this is the spiritual awakening we're returning to our first husband. There's a remnant awakening, and there's an awakening happening globally, but especially in this nation that is creating a hunger to return to our first husband. Our original covenant was with him. Our original covenant was with him. The reason America and Israel are the two most hated nations in the world is because they're the only two nations that were birthed out of covenant with God. It goes on to say, and this is where we are, I'm telling you. For she did not know that I gave her grain, new wine, oil, and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. The blessing that we're experiencing in this nation came from him and the covenant that we have with him. But because earthly wisdom is taken over, which is sensual according to the word and demonic, We've given credit to all of this idolatry as to why this nation is so prosperous. Is this making sense to y'all? That's why I believe this is where we are because this awakening is creating a spiritual hunger to return to our first husband. The Constitution was divinely inspired by our forefathers. How else could someone right that all men are created equal at a time when they were slavery because God was using their pen to prophesy the very thing that would destroy slavery we were standing right under President Lincoln's statue yesterday and God used him as the spearhead to fulfill the very thing he inspired in the Constitution that all men are created equal and that they're endowed by God by their creator with certain unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They were prophesying the end of slavery when they were writing those documents. 
Is, that, is this making sense? Okay, it says, Therefore, I will return and take away my grain in its time and my new wine in its season, and I will take back my wool and linen given to her to cover her nakedness. This is the exposure that we're in. Do you realize that we have gone from a very manageable debt before Barack Obama was elected to, to where we're $34 trillion in debt as a nation? Right. And so the, the last time the budget was balanced was when Bill Clinton was in office. And it was because of Newt Gingrich. This is what idolatry produces. It produces robbing, killing. It produces destroying. I just saw yesterday where because of uh, the geniuses that are running California, and this is why I shared with you yesterday and we repented and forgave everybody because it's hard it's hard not to have bitterness when you're watching stupidity that's destroying so many lives. So in California, the geniuses that are leading that raised the minimum wage in the fast food industry to $20 an hour. One restaurant shut down this week, 48 restaurants. 10,000 people were immediately unemployed in the fast food industry. Here's what's interesting fact is that they're making fast food restaurants pay $20 an hour, but Gavin Newsom owns a, vinery, a, a vineyard where they have a burger shop in it, and they only pay him $7 an hour. Wow. Yeah. yeah, Panera Bread makes bread on site, so they don't have to pay it. But here's the point that I'm trying to make. When a spirit of control is in, it accuses everyone else of the very thing it's doing. It's accusing the fast food restaurants of grinding the face of the poor, and it's grinding the face of the poor. Does that make sense? It says, now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers. Oh, my gosh, how many of you realize how many different major ministers have all of a sudden been exposed recently and they've had to step down yeah. it's because we're in a timing of the lord where he is delivering a nation yeah. and when you're getting delivered every idolatry gets exposed yeah. yes amen I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall deliver her from my hand. I will cause all of her mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons, her Sabbaths, all her appointed feasts, and I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, of which she has said, These are my wages that my lover has given me. I'm telling you, man, this is so... Understand the Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. When it, people give themselves over to idolatry, it all, always manifests in the same pattern. But in the kingdom, he says, behold, I do a new thing. There are new things in the kingdom. God is doing a new thing, I believe, in our hearts individually and also in our nation. So I will make them a forest, and the beast of the field shall eat them. I will punish her for the days of the bales to which she burned incense. She decked herself with her earrings and jewelry, and she went after her lovers. But me she forgot, says the Lord. Okay, so that's everything I believe that's happening right now, bringing exposure both in the church and in the, and, uh, our civil government. But then there's a remnant within a remnant that, and there's an awakening that's happening, and it starts in verse 14. And it says, therefore, behold, I will allure her, and I will bring her into the wilderness, and there I will speak comfort to her. So understand when you find yourself in a wilderness, it's not punishment, it's God's deliverance. 
The first purpose of a wilderness in your life is to help you be able to hear God's voice clearer. I will speak kindly to her. What is the Holy Spirit? He's the comforter. And she, it says this, and I will give her her vineyards from there. The fruit of the Spirit, that this is where the fruit of the Spirit is developed. In the promised land, you have giants to deal with. In the wilderness, you have to deal with God. <laughs> because he's trying to prepare our heart to be ready for the promised land. And the valley of Acre as a door of hope. The word Acre means trouble. The place of your trouble becomes a door of hope. In David's situation, King David, Goliath was the door to his destiny. Joseph's being thrown into a pit and sold into slavery was the door to his destiny. I'm just trying to tell you that it's one of the things, the disappointment of trying to figure out why am I in this wilderness? Why is that not changing? People do more stuff to sabotage God's purpose in their life in that time because they allow unbelief to come in and they start believing a lie over the truth. They start believing their circumstances over what God's prophetic word is over their life. And so since it's this way, and that didn't look like the way I thought it was supposed to happen, it must not have been God. God told Joseph, your brothers are going to bow down and worship you. He didn't tell them the wilderness he was going to have to walk to to get to that point where they're bowing down to worship him. God will always show us where he's taking us, but if he showed us the path, it wouldn't require faith to get there. And it says in the scripture, everything that's not of faith is sin. So when we give in to the lies of the enemy, when we're trying to see a prophetic word fulfilled, and we start doing things that are counterproductive to what God's called us to, actually the prophetic word becomes the idol that we're worshiping, because then we start thinking, if I can just get to the fulfillment of that, then my life will really mean something. Your life already really means something. If I can just get to where I'm doing this or I'm doing that. You know, God never let me travel in his goodness when I actually wanted to travel. He never let me go speak anywhere when I thought I was going to light the world on fire. I had to get to the point where I said, you know what, Lord, I'm good if I don't ever travel. You're enough. Yeah, that's exactly right. Do you know why, and I shared this with Verlinda, how many of you know why God, a prophet, is not without honor except in his own home? <laughs> I'm going to tell you why. Because God wants us to be addicted to obedience, not the praise of men. I do this because I don't need praise. I do it because I'm being obedient. But he had to take me through a wilderness to deliver me from the idolatry. My idolatry was thinking I'm really going to be able to help the kingdom of God if I can just get to where I'm traveling and speaking. And the few times he let me speak during that period, like it was like I threw it out there thinking it was great revelation and it fell like a lead balloon. I'm like, what is going on here, you know? <laughs> and the reason is because I had not allowed the wilderness process to take the proper effect to bring me into the humility and into the character I needed to sustain the weight of him Fulfilling what he showed me he was going to do. His delay is not punishment. His delay is for your protection. The wilderness is not punishment. It's the path to the promise. It says, and she shall sing there as in the days of her youth when she came out of the land of Egypt. The wilderness is a time where God is refreshing us. Do you have something you want to share? No, no. Oh, okay. Okay. There you go. Come on. 
And then here's the key, that you will call me my husband and no longer call me master. The wilderness that we're in as a nation, it's because they're part of the, what God's wanting to do with the Elijahs is there are millions of believers that are trapped under a spirit of control that know him as master and God wants them to know him as husband. Something very interesting in scripture is Moses said, Lord, I want to see your face. And what did God say? No man has seen my face and lived. I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock, let all my goodness pass before you. But then when David, this, is, this shows you the difference between grace and the law. When David was caught in adultery, he had slept with another man's wife then had him murdered and got her pregnant. I believe it's Psalms 37 when Nathan the prophet confronts him over a year after he's kept this hidden. And David says, Lord, please don't take your presence from me. It reveals David's heart. He knew it wasn't his wealth that was the most valuable thing he had. It wasn't his power and it wasn't his position. It was the presence of God. Here's what's interesting. The Hebrew word for presence and the Hebrew word for face was the same word. So what that tells you is this, that if your focus is legalism or the law, there are aspects of God that you can't handle because it'll kill you. But if your focus is intimacy with God and relationship, he'll reveal all of himself to you. David was saying, don't take your face from me. The very same thing that he told Moses because his focus was the law, no man has seen me and lived. So much so that God allowed David to build the tabernacle of David and in a time where only a few people a few times a year could go into the presence of God, he instituted the tabernacle of David that had the presence of God in it that all of them could go into 24 hours a day. In an old covenant, he brought a whole nation into the new covenant as far as access to the presence of God is concerned. In order to make this transition to that level of intimacy, look at verse 17. I will take from her mouth the names of the Baals, and they shall be remembered no more. The wilderness confronts idolatry in our own life and also corporately in the body of Christ. The reason is because he says, I will have no other gods before me. Now, people can continue to go after false gods. But how many of you have known somebody really walking in the things of the Spirit and all of a sudden they've completely walked away? Why? Because what they started worshiping is who they'll become. And if you allow compromise in your life and it becomes idolatry, it begins to shut down your ability to see God, hear God. It shuts you down completely. Absolutely. And then the last part of this that I just wanted to share is it talks about, in that day I'll make a covenant with them, with the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and with the creeping things of the ground. Bow and sword of battle I will shatter from the earth to make them lie down safely. This is the new covenant it's talking about right here. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice. His throne is established on righteousness and justice. It says in scripture that Mount Zion is filled with righteousness and justice. Don't let the injustice that you're seeing right now in our nation convince you that the enemy is winning. Don't let the injustice of what you're seeing in our nation right now convince you the enemy is winning. Because God never exposes without bringing justice. It's just that justice doesn't always come when we think it should come.
Absolutely. Do you want me to tell you what are the biggest things that I have seen in the natural that tell me the spiritual awakening that's happening? Um, number one is what happened with Bud Light. Number two is the billions that have been lost by Target. Number three is the what's happened in Hollywood where people have quit basically going to the movies. And number four is when President Trump was unjustly convicted of 34 counts, within a week he had raised almost a half a billion dollars in fundraising. Now, well, you would ask, why is it that you would say that's your biggest clue in the natural of the awakening that's happening in the spiritual? Because the Bible says where your treasure is, your, your, where your heart is, your treasure will be also. And when people stop being willing to invest their money into something that's immoral, when they are willing to invest their money into something that people know is injustice, there's a spiritual awakening happening. And in the nation of Israel, every time they were awakened, they came to the point where they first woke up to their idolatry before God gave them the deliverance that they were asking for. Once you wake up to the idolatry, it creates a spiritual hunger to come out of it and to come back into right relationship with God. And so what did this say in the first verses? We'll return to our first lover. That was one of the churches in Revelation. You've left your first love. Whenever we leave our first love, it doesn't mean we don't love. It just means we're loving something that's an idol. (laughs) I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know... The Lord. It shall come in that day that I will answer, says the Lord. I will answer the heavens and they shall answer the earth. I'm telling you, God is hearing our prayers. He is answering. Do we? It was a warning the Lord gave me. He said, You better be very careful because you're letting what you see keep you from seeing what I'm answering. What you see will be the very thing that keeps you from seeing. He said, you be, he told me personally, you better be careful because what you see is keeping you from seeing. He took me to 2 Kings 7. That was where the people were suffering. They were starving. Women were making deals with other women to eat their children. And the captain of the king's guard was so disheartened when the prophetic word of the Lord came that said, by this time tomorrow, all of this is going to be over. He basically said in King James, I'll believe it when I see it. And this is what the Lord spoke. You'll see it, but you won't get to eat of it. He saw the breakthrough and was crushed by the weight of the people going after what God intended for him to have as well. So a lot of times what happens when we lose heart in the midst of what we're seeing is instead of celebrating other people's breakthrough, we get crushed by them. Because we believe the lie that God's withholding from us, but he's willing to do it for them. Is this making sense? This is all part of God. I just want you to understand. He's dealing with me personally, making sure I've gotten all of the idolatry out of my own life. Why? Because I have to have the character needed as a good father. He has to make sure the character needed is developed to handle the weight of the promise fulfilled. So that the very thing he gives you, when he gives you a fish, it's actually a fish. It doesn't become a viper. It says, and I will answer the heavens and they shall answer the earth. The earth shall answer with grain, with new wine, and with oil. They shall, call, they shall answer Jezreel, and this is key, 23. I'll sow her for myself in the earth, and I will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy. 
And here it is. Then I will say to those people who are not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. This is prophesying about the new covenant. Because the Gentiles at this time were not his people. But he's saying, there will be a people that is not my people that will say, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. I firmly believe that this is what we're walking out. It's not a manifestation of the enemy winning. It's a part of the process of the deliverance of God. Let me just tell you, I was so bitter after the 2020 election because I felt like the Lord had given me a word as to what was going to happen. He told me that President Trump, in his first term, he said, I'm stacking the court in your favor. He will put three on the Supreme Court in his first term and two on his second term. Now, now I didn't, he never told me there were going to be consecutive terms. But at the same time, when 2020 happened, I was so offended by God. I was more offended with God than the people who stole it. They're all being driven by demons and idolaters. I, I get that. I was so discouraged. I was like, God, why would I ever speak another word for you? I mean, literally, I shut down for a little while because I was like, if this is how it's going to be, I don't even care what you're saying. I know that sounds harsh, but, you know, God is not afraid. He's a good father. There are times where my kids come to me with a bad attitude. It doesn't make them not my kids. It just makes me have to manifest and demonstrate love and wisdom to make sure that they don't let that completely derail their relationship with me. Does this make sense? And so that's how it was with me. And so it's so, it's so funny because he kept putting me in positions where I had to release the word of the Lord. And I would be releasing the word of the Lord not even knowing if I believed it myself because of the wound and the frustration and the discouragement of what had just happened. And so I'm just telling you, this is not, this, this is something that is, a, it says Elijah was a man just like we are. Yeah. See, we read these characters in the Bible, and because we know the end result, we automatically assume, well, they were super spiritual, we're not. We're just, Elijah was a man just like we are. And as just a man empowered by the Spirit, he prayed and he stopped the rain. And then he prayed again, and guess what? The rain started. He wasn't even the greatest in the Old Testament, according to Jesus. He said, of born of woman, there's no greater than John the Baptist. And yet the least of the kingdom is greater than he. That means every single person sitting in here carries more authority than Elijah did when he was walking the earth. Now, see, immediately when I say that, all of us, including me, you're like, oh, I don't know about that. Where are the signs? You know what I'm saying? They're coming. They're coming. But at the same time, you need to understand, delay is God's protection. He said a perverse generation looks for a sign. When they were demanding Jesus perform for them, he said, you're a perverse generation looks for a sign. I'm not justifying not having signs. I'm saying God's dealing with the perversion in the church before he starts releasing the signs. Because we have this tendency in the church, there's an all-out addiction in the body of Christ to the praise of men. And people are doing out of talent what they should be doing out of anointing. I am not a talented speaker. Right? But at the same time, I don't care because I just want to make sure it's the anointing that's getting released and the authority of God. How do I know that's happening? Not because people are falling down. I know it because people are getting free. One of the things the anointing has called me to do is God gives me scripture like a puzzle and he allows me to put it in something that's so simple anybody can eat it and take it in and begin to realize how to live in it. 
Now, whether a person chooses to or not, that's up to them. But I'm just trying to help you understand every single one of you carries a, an anointing, carries a purpose, carries a ministry that is vital to the kingdom of God. And don't let the idolatry of comparison convince you any other way. You can't run anybody else's race. So stay in your lane. <laughs> Is this making sense? I'm just trying to help you understand all these things the enemy seduces us into where we start worshiping an idol. Well, I don't preach like this person, so God can't use me. Or I'm not leading this group. And we start to base our value on what we're doing, not who God says we are. Does anybody have any questions? Anybody think I'm full of it? Uh, come on. Exactly right. As God tells us in there that he was given charge over his garden. Do you know what your garden represents? Your heart. And we watch over our heart, and we're a gatekeeper of our heart, then the one that he called was the most cunning, the serpent, would not be able to creep in and deceive you into believing things that turn you towards an idol. That's exactly how it happens. So it starts with being a watchman and truly understanding what a watchman does first. Yeah, that's good. And he protects it from the enemy creeping in through our thoughts and the, our, the things that we do that cause us to turn to an idol which destroys our life. It's that simple. And we're not trying to do things for God's affection. We're trying to come to a place where we live from his affection. Absolutely. We're not working. I've heard it put this way. We're not working for victory. We're working from victory everything's already been done I know we have battles but the end result the game has already been fixed the score final score has already been revealed it's just a matter of us fulfilling our part to be the part of the team that God's anointed us and called us to be a part of so I want to just close with James 3, 14 and 18. It says, but if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, these are all, this is all idolatry. Do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. For where there is envy and self-seeking exists, confusion and every evil thing are there. But, if, if, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. When you see hypocrisy present, you know it's earthly wisdom. There's a demon working. The scripture is in James 3, 14 through 18. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Peace is not the absence of conflict, it's the presence of a person. Sometimes the most loving and compassionate thing you can do for someone is to tell them what they believe is a lie. What we're doing in this nation is only the Antichrist spirit when it comes to all of these issues where people are saying this is okay, this is normal, whole, whole denominations are approving of it, putting leadership, those that are living in perversion. That's not love. That's not compassion. That's actually hatred. 
not confronting someone's delusion and giving yourself over to their delusion is not compassion. It's deception. And so just encourage you. When we love, we love people in spite of where they are, but we don't let them stay there just like Jesus didn't let us stay where we were. The woman caught in adultery, he didn't turn and say, well, that's okay. He said, go and sin no more. He protected her from attack, but he didn't lower the standard in the process. So I think it, what we did yesterday, I mean, this, God used this house to stand and confront principalities and gates of hell that are holding people in bondage. That's amazing. And what I want to encourage you to do is this is a season in the wilderness where just take inventory if God reveals there's any idolatry in your heart and deal with it so that whatever measure that idolatry is trying to keep you from seeing, keep you from being aware of where God is and what God's saying in the moment, that thing can be removed. Because I believe every altar that's gone from an altar to God to honor God. How many of you realize that our whole system in this nation was built to honor God? The three branches of government, they're based off of Isaiah 33, 22. He is our king, our judge, and our lawgiver. The legislative, judicial, and executive branch were founded based off of influence from that scripture. On our godly foundation, that same godly foundation when it comes to God as our judge was the very foundation that made it okay to kill the unborn. But God only let it go for so long and in the 49th year, he overturned it because God never lets the enemy have a jubilee. 50 is the number of jubilee. And so I just encourage you, we are walking towards the promise, not walking away from it. In his goodness, he is delivering us from idolatry. In his goodness, he's tuning our ears to hear his voice. In his goodness, even since 2020, I'm a different person than I was now than I was then because the fruit of the Spirit and my capacity to trust God has increased after I was so shaken and revealing that my relationship with him, what does it say? Moses knew God's ways, but the children of Israel only knew God's acts. And if your relationship with God is based off of what he does or does not do, it always keeps you positioned to go back into idolatry. The moment they got under pressure in the wilderness, they took the wealth that God had given them and they built an idol. There's so many people I know that have these huge prophetic words over financial provision. And I tell them, they're like, why is this taking so long? I said, it's taking so long because when you get into that wilderness of that money first being at your access, you're going to get under pressure. And if your character is not developed, you're going to use the very thing he gave you for the promised land to build an altar in the wilderness to start worshiping idols. And so I just encourage you, let God's, let his process work in you. Trust him. Let go of every lie that you may be believing that you've in some way, shape, or form done something that made him mad. And that's why it hadn't happened yet. Or maybe you miss God. No, no, no. None of that. This is all about the delays of God being for your protection and the wilderness being a part of the path to get to the promised land. Does this make sense? Okay, so Father, I thank you for these amazing people. I just thank you so much, Lord God, for the fact that to me, what the Lord keeps saying to me is, this is only the beginning. This is not the end, this is just the beginning. And Lord, I want to thank you for what you've shown me for our nation. I shared this with people at dinner I was praying for our nation, and 
and the Lord showed me, me with a group of people, y'all were all part of it. We were looking at this mountain, and the mountain was, there was flashes of lightning, and there was smoke, and there was, I mean, it looked like a, it was intimidating. And I can remember in the dream, I thought, this must have been what Moses felt like looking at Mount Sinai. And the voice of the Lord said, do not fear, for I'm in the middle of this. And so what you're seeing right now, do not fear, he's in the middle of it. And he said to me, and this is not talking about the law as far as in the spirit realm, we've come to Mount Zion. He said that I am reestablishing the law in this land and I am breaking off lawlessness. And I had another vision. I, my favorite movie is The, the, the Gladiator. And at the end of the gladiator, when Maximus is mortally wounded, but he's killed the unrighteous king, the unrighteous Caesar, Commodus, he looks at the the old Caesar's daughter who was murdered, and he says, Lucius, which was her child, is safe. Return the government back to the hands of the people. And I just declare that. I felt like the Lord said, before I die... I'm going to see the children safe and the government of this nation return to the hands of the people. And so, Lord, we trust you in the midst of everything that's going on, in the midst of the shaking and the chaos. And we celebrate that we're on a path of deliverance for this nation that will leave this nation as a righteous inheritance to our children's children. Lord, I bless what's happening here At Eagle's Nest, I bless, Lord God, the Moseses and the Elijahs that you're raising up, the Nazarites that you're raising up. And we understand, Lord God, that all of it is related to deliverance. All of it is related to bringing, Lord, those who are held in captive by someone else's choice into freedom and those who are prisoners because of their own choice being brought into that same freedom. Because, Lord, you came to set both captives and prisoners free. So how a person got in those circumstances, you don't care because the price you paid was to set them free. And Lord, we will just worship you because we recognize what we worship, we become. And if we keep our focus on you, we become like you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, God bless you. Thank you. speak blessings and honor over him right now in the name of Jesus. Father, we, we speak favor that's the lord said he wants to give you great favor get him safely home father without any incident whatsoever father we take dominion over animals buses people it doesn't matter what it is we take dominion over it and we decree that he will arrive home safely and father that he will walk into a home where there is peace and love and truth in there peace especially and even in your church, that there will be peace in your church. So, Father, we thank you for what you have deposited in him. And, Father, we thank you that you brought him up here and that he was obedient to come. And, Father, he not only shares what you've deposited in him, but he shares the love that, you're, that you have deposited in him to us. And, Father, we value that and we value him. We speak honor over him right now in the name of Jesus. So bless him, God, in Jesus' name. And Father, we thank you that you're preparing us for yet again. There's there's another uh, thing that we will be endeavoring. And Father, we thank you for his uh, his leadership uh, and the mentorship that he provides here because it is extremely value and we value it and him. So thank you for the divine alignment that you have set up here. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Father, let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' sovereign name, amen. Amen. Amen.